in psychology, uh, we tend to focus very much on, uh, on internal variables when we look at influences on people's behavior. So things like uh, our genes, our biology, um, the influences that these might have um, over, over who we are and what we do, personality, right? Am I an extrovert? I love people and getting up on TED stages and talking to everybody, right? Or am I an introvert and I wanna run and hide right now, right? Uh, these, these are uh, uh, internal types of variables, cognitions that we might have. Um, I hold these beliefs, I hold these thinking styles, I think fast or I think slow, right? For those of you who know Kahneman and Tversky. Um, but there's more, and psychology, most psychologists also uh, subscribe to something called the biopsychosocial model. So we talk about the biological influences, the psychological influences, but the social influences over behavior are also important. I know you're saying, when are we gonna get to the drinking? Just about there. <laughs> Hold on, I had a bigger build up for this. Part of those social influences are things like rules and laws. And we think they have a big control over behavior, but Methodist is a, is a dry campus. Or is it? <laughs> so <laughs> this is, this is data uh, that I collected over 2017 to 2019 uh, from Methodist University students on alcohol and uh, drug use. We're gonna focus primarily on the um, alcohol use here. Uh, but you'll notice uh, there's some demographics up there tell a little bit about our student population. But uh, in any given week, 40.25% of Methodist University students have used alcohol. And in any given week, 20% of uh, Methodist students have reported binge drinking. We don't exactly have the reputation of a party school right here at Methodist University. But I wanna tell you that, uh, that in this study, by the way, which I had titled Rain in the Desert, right? Uh, in this study, I compared these uh, percentages to ECU, right? Party School Central, ECU. UNC Chapel Hill, NC State. These percentages line up exactly with what we see in terms of student alcohol use at these large state party universities. <laughs> so, the more you know. <laughs> uh, this leads us to two questions to get to the point of my talk. <laughs> Why do our students drink, <laughs> right? Even when we have these rules and these laws not to drink, right? We're told, we tell them we want a safe space for our children, right? We, we want to provide a, a solid learning atmosphere for our children. It's, Think of the children, always, <laughs> right? Uh, factors into all that we're doing. Why are, they, why are they drinking? I told them not to. The second question, corollary to that, is why do, why do our students drinking uh, alcohol use mirror so closely the alcohol use of students at these big party schools with different rules? Different, well, if you're under 21, the law is still the same, but <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, different rules and laws, et cetera. So my contention is that binge drinking is considered normative for college students. Think of a typical college movie and the prototype movie that uh, comes to my mind is Animal House, <laughs> right? Which gives us the classic line, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, right? Um, but it, 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 it's, in, it's not even featured part of the movie, it's just in, in the background there constantly. Students that are here, I see a lot of students here, don't answer out loud, right? Especially if you're under 21, right? <laughs> Whatever, but students that are here, what do you talk about? Like how much of your time coming to back to classes on a Monday or whatever is spent talking about who did what, who was so messed, right? I see the heads nodding, <laughs> right? Um, it's just an inherent part of, of our culture, of our so societal norms uh, concerning college students and alcohol use. In other words, the perception 
i.e. the social norm, is that students party. Okay. This is what I, uh, I explored in Techsperiment. So what is Techsperiment? The uh, information, the technical information is up here. Um, but basically, it was a trick that we pulled on, on freshman students. <laughs> I was looking to do some research. I had no money, no funding, no grants. Sad, I know. Uh, <laughs> the director of the Center for Research and Creativity at the time, it was Center for Undergraduate Research and Creativity, but we've come a long way, right, uh, here at Methodist. Uh, but the, the director at the time was supposed to give a talk to each of these, you know, freshmen, uh, back then it was what, FYS classes, right? to the FYS classes about the Center for Research and Creativity. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we randomly assigned uh, half of the students to receive uh, Techsperiment, right? And the other half just didn't. We just told them, hey, there's research and creative stuff here, right, at uh, Methodist. So what is Techsperiment? Well, it's four questions, right? And I can tell you all about this, but it's four questions designed to to do two things. The first is to uh, uh, bring to awareness students' beliefs, these norms surrounding alcohol use, and then to bring to students' awareness what the actual behavior is. So now, pull out those cell phones, open that app, <laughs> get ready to experience, I actually wrote this down, get ready to experience tech experiment. <laughs> It sounded a lot better on the, on the page uh, here. Okay. So here's what room you want to put in. 393-543. You will see a question come up. Can you swoop me, baby? There we go. Next swoop. There it is. And you will see through the wonders of modern technology a graph appearing before your very eyes. So the first question. How many days a week does the average student uh, drink alcohol? And what you're putting up there is pretty typical of the responses that we would get from uh, students in tech experiment. How many days did you drink last week? Uh, hit show results. Okay. <laughs> There's always a smart aleck or somebody with a serious problem. Uh, you can see me. <laughs> you can see me after <laughs> after we're done. Uh, <laughs> so this is exactly the, the the tenor of the results that we got. This is actual data from uh, one of the text uh, experiment sessions that we uh, that we did. We did this with four, we used four questions instead of two. And we, we didn't just ask about how many days a week. We also asked how, how, much, how much alcohol does the average student drink when they do party? And we would see the same thing. They would say, they drink a lot, <laughs> right? And, and so on and so forth. And then all we did was say, what do you think about this? Talk to each other. And they went off and talked to each other. For the following school year, the rest of the school year, this was done at the beginning of the fall semester, incoming freshmen. Over the rest of fall semester, throughout spring semester, we took periodic measures of the weekly student alcohol use. We had half of our freshman students uh, had this, answered these four questions and talked about them, and half didn't. This graph is showing the results for the frequency of alcohol. Um, for those of you that are statistical nerds, and I know you're gonna criticize, these are 95% confidence intervals. These are not standard error bars. For, if you know stats, this is really cool, right? This is, this is pretty dramatic, 95% confidence intervals. For you bigger stats nerds who want, I did a t-test, uh, so <laughs> we had a t-test, 2.77, p-value less than 0.01, so, uh, you know, so uh, it ticks all those uh, statistical boxes. The group in blue, this, I don't know if it has a pointer, I'll point. The group in blue, uh, group one here, is our tech experiment group. These are the students that answered those four questions. 
Their average drinking was 0.7 days per week, right? Why not one? Well, because it's an average of, you know, 100-something students. The group in red are the students who did not attend Texperiment, and we see around a 1.5, 1.6 uh, average days per week. We saw the same pattern of results in terms of how much they drank. I didn't tell them not to drink. I didn't tell them, we're a dry campus, you're an embarrassment. <laughs> we'll kick you out of the dorms. Your life will be ruined. We'll tell your parents, right? None of that. They just talked to each other about what was going on. So normally this is where I end the presentation because we have some statistically cool results and I go, thank you, good night, and whatever. But we're here to talk about change, <laughs> right? So what happened? How did we change this drinking behavior in a large population of human beings, right? What is it that, um, that was the mechanism behind it? There were no laws, no shoulds, no shouldn'ts. Um, those didn't work. I mean, we can see right here what those laws and rules and regulations do. They do nothing, right? Um, this had some kind of impact. So I like to stir up the pot every once in a while, so I found a very controversial quote. This comes from Judith Rich Harris. Uh, she has passed away now, but uh, from a book she uh, wrote called The Nurture Assumption. She, she had the nerve to write a, a, a field-changing book in psychology despite never having finished her PhD because of a life-threatening disease and you know all this kind of stuff. Uh, but quote from the book. It is better to come from a dysfunctional family in a good neighborhood than a functional family in a bad neighborhood. How many of you does that hit just the wrong way? <laughs> right? It hits just a little bit off. Feels just a little bit off. There's controversy in this. For those of you who don't like controversy, here's some less controversial, uh, controversial quotes. So, Jim Rohn, a uh, noted uh, uh, inspirational speaker. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If you lay with dogs, you'll get fleas, my dad, right? Uh, if you hang out in a barber shop long enough, you'll end up with a haircut, also my dad. <laughs> and he also said empty barrels make the most noise, but we'll save that one for another talk. Um, what all these quotes are really getting at, what they're implying is that what we learn to be normal, right? What we learn to be what most people do becomes the behavior that we adopt, right? That's the truism that comes from, that the, all of these quotes are trying to, um, to imply. Me telling you um, not to drink won't work. Why? Because I have no credibility. Oh, that's just Dr. Klein, he's the man not in a sexist kind of way or whatever, but you know what I mean? Like, he's one of those. He's a professor. He's clueless. What does he know about life? Probably never touched a drop of alcohol in his <laughs> life. And he doesn't even know what fun is. Have you seen how he, <laughs> you seen how he dresses? Look at his hair, for God's sake, right? You know, uh, I have no credibility uh, with that crowd, right? With Texperiment, what I demonstrated is, what if the message is a credible message? What they did is they looked around and they felt probably a little self-conscious. I didn't drink last week at all. I'll just put in zero, it's anonymous. And then they looked around because the bar was going <laughs> And they realized, wow, I'm what most people do. Takes away that pressure, right? Takes away, and in fact, I would argue that it provides pressure to bring their behavior more in line with what they've learned the new norms actually are. We have a theory uh, to describe this in psychology, uh, cognitive dissonance theory, uh, posited by Leon Festinger. Um, basically, in a very simplistic way, it states that when our behavior and our beliefs are, uh, are, are not in alignment, something, it, we're gonna feel a state of cognitive dissonance, dis-ease, we're gonna feel ill, uh, feel Ill at ease, and something has to change. Either our behavior will change or our uh, beliefs will change. And it happens both ways. Methodist University, we have other, uh, I have other research which shows 
we have a surprisingly large number of freshmen who come in who are uh, totally against drinking. Drinking's bad, it's the devil, it's horrible, it's awful, right? And you can watch their beliefs and their behavior slowly change, right? As they become more exposed to students and their drink. And it go but my, what the experiment showed is that it goes both ways, right? There are larger, farther ranging implications from all this as well. Um, my colleague, Dr. Cronin, uh, we actually have uh, some overlap, so a lot of this I'm gonna leave to him uh, to explain in his wonderful talk, which is gonna um, close this out. But this has implications for all sorts of phenomena, um, political polarization, right? The, um, the informational news silos, the echo political echo chambers that we see, right? The problem really with these things is that they set ideas, uh, expectations, norms for what behavior is appropriate, is expected, is approved. So what can we do? Well, you can make behavioral change easier if you can create situations that are consistent with the change that you wanna see, right? Changes that are real, that are credible. You can become a better person. Be, be the change that you want to see. How I many of you have that bumper sticker, you know, right? Be the, ch what, what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> well, what this tells us is that what it means is reach out to people that are outside of your little corner of the world. Expose yourself to information, right? From other viewpoints and other sources. Take all the, gather all the information, all the facts that you can Right, and see if your, if your behavior aligns with what is, uh, what is the norm. I don't know if that solution is gonna change anything, but it's good enough for a TED Talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>